Hey everyone, Seth here from Theology with Seth, and today we're going to be talking about Christianity. We'll be going over the basic beliefs, we'll be talking about the verses that uh, underscore each of those beliefs, and how they all fit together in one grand picture. Christianity, if you didn't know, is my own religion, so I'm super excited to get into it. I know you are too, so let's jump right in. A couple of quick facts. It's based on the Bible. I read out of the English Standard Version, but really, you can't go wrong with any of the major translations. It started roughly 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, founded by someone named Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth was like the hometown that Jesus grew up in. Um, he was just a poor Galilean carpenter who ministered in Israel from... 30 AD to 33, so not very long at all, and yet today it's the world's largest religion. In fact, 2.4 billion people identify as Christians. So regardless of what your religious beliefs are, I think you have to admit that's pretty astonishing because it's not like Jesus was this military warrior or Roman emperor or something. The guy was a construction worker. He was the person in the, the yellow vest that you pass by when you're on your way to work and don't think anything of, and yet to this day, one third of the planet worships him if I wasn't a Christian today, I, I would be super curious to know just what exactly it was about this man that was so compelling. And if you don't have the answer to that already, I think you will by the end of this. So let's talk about the doctrine of God in Christianity. Probably the most fundamental thing you need to know is that God is a trinity. Now the word trinity is not in the Bible, but the concept is. And basically it goes a little something like this. First of all, there is only one true God. The word for that is monotheism. That means there's only one true God. Every other God is a false God. We get this from Deuteronomy 4. It says, To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord is God. There is no other besides him. Then God himself says, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. And then in the New Testament, same thing. Jesus says, and this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Interestingly enough, if you look at the original Greek behind that, the words for only and God are monos and theos. You put those together, you get monotheism. That's where that comes from. And so in that sense, we actually have a lot in common with our Muslim friends and our Jewish friends in that we're monotheists. We believe there's only one true God. Every other God is a false God. But for us, there's actually a little bit more to the story. Because even though there's only one true God, three persons are called God in Scripture. And they're revealed to us as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We actually get a glimpse of this early on when we look in um, the very first chapter of the Bible. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So we have a singular God here, yet he refers to himself using plural personal pronouns. What that means is that there's more to this God than meets the eye. There's a certain plurality of personhood within himself. And that gets unpacked more as the scriptures progress. We see that the Father's called God in 1 Peter 2. The Son is also called God. Thomas answers him, my Lord and my God in John 20, 28. Likewise, Paul writes, we're waiting for our blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then the Holy Spirit is also God. There's this story in the book of Acts where Peter says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You have not lied to man, but to God. And then in the Great Commission, Jesus tells us to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The word name back then carried a lot more significance than it does with us today. It, it referred to a person's character and being. So the fact that the Holy Spirit shares the same name, singular, as the Father and the Son means that he is on the same level. Theologians say they, they are co-equal and co-eternal in all of their essential attributes. Now, if this were all that the Bible taught, this would actually be pretty easy to conceptualize. And not surprisingly, this is where we see a lot of analogies coming up. Some people have suggested that God is like an actor in a play, where he, he comes out on stage and he's the, the mayor. And then he goes back behind the curtain, changes clothes, comes out for another scene, and he's the, the fisherman. Or some people have said, well, maybe God's like a man who wakes up in the morning next to his wife and he's a husband then he goes to work and he's a fireman and then he comes home and plays with his kids and he's a father and he's all these things. The problem with that analogy is this third truth here and that's that these three persons are distinct from one another. So basically that just means the father's not the son, the son is not the spirit, and the spirit is not the father. Part of the way we know this is that there's a lot of times in scripture where we see all three persons doing something different in different places at the same time and we also see them interacting with one another. For instance, when Jesus was baptized, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, 
This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. So we have the Father in heaven, Jesus on earth, and the Holy Spirit descending from one to the other. So thinking about our analogy with the play, it breaks down pretty quickly because none of those characters are on the stage at the same time. But here we do see all the persons on stage at the same time, so to speak. Then consider the fact that Jesus prayed. He said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Who's he praying to there? He's not praying to himself. It's not a charade. He's actually communicating with someone else. And he says, not as I will, but as you will. There's more than one will there. There's more than one person there. Likewise, we see in Romans, Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. So the picture here is that the Father is in one place, we are in another. Christ is in the middle, interceding on our behalf. It doesn't work if there's only one person involved going on different roles at different times. It, it must be three distinct persons. For those of you who are visual learners, this might help. I did not create this, I stole it, but I think it's helpful. Basically, if you look in the middle, we see that there's one God, and then branching off from that, we see that the Father's God, the Spirit's God, the Son's God. But then if you look on the edges, the sides, the Father's not the Spirit, Spirit's not the Son, Son is not the Father. So you don't have to present it exactly like that, but somehow you need to get to the point where you're ready to affirm that there is one God in three persons. Now you might say, well, Seth, that's kind of hard to understand, and I totally get it, but you know, wouldn't we expect God, like the creator of the universe, to transcend our understanding just a little bit? If he was too simple, I would think we were probably making him up. The fact is he, he has a much greater existence than we can even comprehend, and this is just one way in which we see that. This one quote here, we don't know who said it, but I think it's true. Try to understand the Trinity and you'll lose your mind. Try to deny it and you'll lose your soul. And I also put here to think about the concept of love. Because when it comes to what we would call Unitarian gods, that is gods where there's just one person, love is a relatively recently added attribute for them. Because it's meaningless until you have something or someone else to love. And so they were all by themselves from all eternity until they started creating humans or angels or something. But that's not the case with the Christian God. He has experienced reciprocal love and adoration within his very being from all eternity. In fact, it's often said that our God's love sort of overflowed and, and went public in creation. So that brings us to our next point, God is our creator. And this is important because it means he has creative rights over us. So sometimes people ask, you know, like, what right does God have to tell me how to live my life? And the answer is that he, he made you. <laughs> he made all of us. Just like if you invent something or create something, you have the right to determine that thing's purpose and how it's intended to function. And according to the Bible, our purpose is to glorify God and to enjoy a relationship with him. We get this from Isaiah. God refers to everyone who is called by my name whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. We see in Acts 17, and he made from one man every nation of mankind, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each of us. So if you're coming to this presentation today wondering about what your purpose is, it is this, that you should seek God and find him and enjoy a relationship with him. And also in the creation account we read, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them, and God blessed them. In the olden times when a king would conquer a new territory, he would spread images of himself throughout the land as a sign of his sovereign rule. And that's who we are. We're intended to fill the earth and bring glory to God as his image bearers. And notice that God blessed them. This pure, unadulterated presence of God with his people. So that's what we're created for. Now, I hope that at this point you might be wondering what exactly happened. Because if, for many of us, if we're honest, we don't feel this closeness with God on a regular basis. In fact, sometimes he seems kind of distant, kind of hidden. There's a reason for that. And that's uh, what theologians call the fall. We rebelled against God. The first humans disobeyed God and broke his law, 
If you know the story, he basically told them just not to eat fruit from this one tree, and they did it anyway. They disobeyed him. That's called sin in the Bible. That's disobedience to God. And th this had catastrophic impacts on the world around us. Nature was broken. God said, cursed is the ground because of you. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And Romans 8.20 says, creation was subjected to futility. Things like tsunamis that wipe out tens of thousands of people or diseases that ravage entire communities, these are a result of sin. And I think it's very telling that when we look at things like cancer in children, there's something deep inside of us that reacts violently to that, and we say that should not happen. Even though from a purely naturalistic standpoint, that's just normal, that's just par for the course. Our hearts know deep down that these things don't belong. They are intruders into God's creation. They are a result of sin. Paul writes, sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Not only was nature broken, but you and I were broken as well. We have all turned away from God in our hearts. Isaiah says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And then we have replaced him with other things. Paul says we have exchanged the glory of the immortal God for other things. In Bible times, people would just replace him with literal false gods, like, like made out of wood and metal and things like that. But in our day, we're a little bit more sophisticated. We've replaced him with things like professional success, romantic relationships, or money. But it's, it's all the same in God's eyes. We've taken God off the throne of our hearts and put something else there. We've created an idol, in other words. And as a result, we have committed countless sins against God and against other people. Um, let's look at some specific examples. So take just a few of the Ten Commandments for a second. You shall have no other gods before me. Well, we already know we've broken that one. That's like the fundamental problem with the world. <laughs> so we've broken that one. Honor your father and mother. Have you ever broken that one? I know I have. You shall not lie. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. How many times have we been envious of something that someone else has, like their paycheck or uh, their spouse or, or significant other? You shall not commit adultery. Now, this is one that I would hope most of us actually haven't done. But in the New Testament, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus equates adultery with lust. He says, if you even look at someone with lustful intent, you have committed adultery with them in your heart. We see something similar with murder. Jesus says that if you even hate your brother in your heart, it's like you've murdered him. And the reason is because our God doesn't just care about outward actions. He cares about inward attitudes, the outside and the inside. And seen in that light, I can tell you I, I'm guilty of breaking pretty much all of these uh, at one point or another, and I suspect you have too. We all have. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So, because we sinned, we are separated from God. Isaiah says, your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. And the reason for this is because God is holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. You know, no other attribute in the entire Bible is repeated in a threefold manner like this. That means there's something special about this. There's something extra important about this attribute of God. And basically, to be holy, it means that he is perfectly pure. He is absolutely righteous. He is unstained, and he is set apart from everything that is impure and wrong and ugly in the world. He can't mix with sin any more than light can mix with darkness. In fact, uh, we read that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And then looking into the future in heaven, it says that nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false. And this brings up, I hope, an uncomfortable question. And that's how does a holy God like this relate to unholy people like us? And the answer is he is our judge. Because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. We read that none is righteous, no, not one. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. They use their tongues to deceive, their mouth is full of curses and bitterness, their feet are swift to shed blood, there's no fear of God before their eyes. Jesus actually says that we're, we're slaves to sin. James says we're enemies of God. 
And it all kind of culminates in what Paul says, namely that we are spiritually dead. Our hearts before God are a flat line. This message often offends people. And the reason it offends people is because, if we're honest, most of us don't think we're that bad. The reason we don't think we're that bad is because we like to compare ourselves to other people. We find the uh, the serial killer on Netflix or the dictator in World War II, and we say, well, I'm not as bad as that person, so I must be doing okay. The problem with that is that God doesn't judge us based on other people. He judges us based on his holy law, the law that we have broken at numerous points. And as a result, we are condemned by God. We're guilty in his eyes. And what does that look like? It means we deserve hell. And this is the point where I know people object and they say, well, that seems a little extreme. I mean, hell, like eternal punishment for just a few sins, like that seems unfair. I heard it explained this way, and I think it might help. What would happen if you slapped this chair, like just walked up to it and hit it as hard as you could? The answer is that nothing would really happen, right? But what would happen if you walked into the office Monday morning and slapped your boss? What would happen then? You'd probably get fired, right? At least. What would happen if you slapped a police officer? you'd probably go to jail. You'd you'd get tased first, (laughs) and then you would go to jail. But then what would happen if you had a king or president and you slapped them in the face? There's a very good chance you might lose your life as a result of that. The reason is because really, it's not about the level of sin. It's about the level of the one who has been sinned against. Or to put it another way, if God is infinitely holy, and eternally righteous, then even what we perceive to be a small sin is an infinite offense against him. And an infinite offense warrants infinite punishment. And that's what hell is. Hell is described in pretty vivid detail in the Bible. It's uh, called a place of eternal punishment in a fiery furnace full of weeping and gnashing of teeth where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched in permanent separation away from the presence of the Lord and his goodness beneath all of God's wrath poured full strength into the cup of his anger where the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever and they have no rest day or night and it is utterly irreversible. Revelation calls it the second death. So obviously the question I hope everyone is asking is what can we do about like what can we do to redeem ourselves? Let me give you some insufficient answers from other religions. Some say, follow the rules as best you can. Be a good person. Or um, keep the commandments of God. You know, you just keep them well enough and you can undo this. All this is basically a way of saying, obey the law of God. Make your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds and just, just be obedient enough. You can tip the scales. But the obvious problem with all of those answers is this. We've already broken the law of God. And we'll continue to break it. We're already guilty in God's eyes. In fact, the harder you try to obey God's law, the more aware you'll become of how far short you'll actually fall. It's like a paradox almost. The closer you get to holiness, the more vividly you see your own sin. Even if it's deep down, the more clearly you'll see it. And finally, the law is what condemns us. It doesn't save us. I've heard it kind of explained like this. The law works a little bit like an x-ray. You know, if you trip and fall and break your wrist, you go get an x-ray. That x-ray can tell you that you're broken, but it doesn't have the power to actually heal you. And in a similar way, the law shows us that we are broken and we are sinful, but it doesn't have the power to actually save us. So Paul writes, by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So the whole point of this is that we cannot save ourselves. We need a savior. Now, I want to pause here just for a minute and think about the gravity of this situation. What if this were the end of the presentation? What if the extent of God's revelation to mankind was, you broke my laws, you're guilty, game over? Can you imagine how hopeless that would be? What what a nightmare of existence we would have if that were true? He could totally do that. We wouldn't be able to say a single word against him. He'd be perfectly just to do that. Well, 
for God so loved the world that that is not the extent of his revelation to mankind because we need a savior and God is our savior. This is where we finally start to see the good news of the gospel. This is where we get to Jesus Christ. So the incarnation, this refers to God the Son coming into the world born as a human. And we see genuine humanity. Okay, that means he didn't just appear human, he was human. He got tired, he got wearied, he was hungry, he eventually died, which we'll unpack later. He experienced the full gamut of human emotions, anger, joy, sorrow. He was like us in every way except one. He was without sin. He did everything right. He never broke God's law. He perfectly kept it. He represented the very best in humanity. John says, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. So we see genuine humanity, and second, we see genuine divinity, or sometimes this is called Christ deity. Basically, it means this, that Jesus didn't stop being God when he came to earth. Rather, he took on a human nature in addition to and alongside of his divine nature. So we can say he's fully God and fully man. Sometimes this is called the hypostatic union. And we see this union played out in a couple of different ways. So for instance, we see Jesus has unparalleled power over diseases. Luke writes, when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to Jesus, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. He cured someone of leprosy on several occasions. You know, leprosy was this horrible skin disease that if you even just brushed up against someone like that, you would be considered unclean. But with Jesus, he touched the people with leprosy, and instead of him becoming unclean, they became clean. They were healed. We see he healed people of paralysis, which we'll look at that story in just a second. He healed people of blindness, and no doubt people had in mind the verse in the Old Testament where God said, I am the Lord, your healer. You know, some of the religious leaders of the day weren't too pleased with Jesus. They actually accused him of healing by the power of demons. But people at the time said, can demons really do all this? Can they really open the eyes of the blind? In the Old Testament, it's the Lord who opens the eyes of the blind. And speaking of demons, we see that he had an unprecedented domination over demons. They brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word. Two demon-possessed men met Jesus coming out of the tombs so fierce that no one could pass that way. They cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a herd of many pigs was feeding at some distance from them, and the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned into the waters. You know, this time of year, we, we see all these new exorcism movies coming out by Hollywood, and it's always this fierce battle between the, usually it's like a Catholic priest and the demon-possessed person, and you never know who's going to win until the very end. That's not the way it was with Jesus at all. He just showed up on the scene, told them to get out, and they were gone. The uh, Protestant reformer Martin Luther wrote a hymn in which he said, The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. Jesus also had unfathomable control over storms. So there's this story. It says, When he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? I love this story because we see the humanity and deity of Christ at the same time. We see he's, he's sleeping because he's tired from the day, but then he rises and exercises his omnipotence by just telling the sea to calm. And the disciples no doubt had in mind Psalm 89, which says, O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, you rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. You know, the reason the waves obeyed Jesus was because they recognized the voice of their creator. Jesus claimed to be the great I am. Just to give you the background of this, if you've ever watched the movie Prince of Egypt or you know the story of the Exodus, 
God appeared to Moses in a burning bush. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. So God is claiming to be the eternally existent, self-sufficient, unchangeable I am. And then Jesus in the New Testament comes along and he applies that same title to himself. There's this one part in John where he claims to have seen Abraham and people say, uh, the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now the Jews, if you know the story, they actually picked up stones to kill him right then and there because they recognized that he was claiming to be the God who appeared to Moses in the Old Testament. He was the recipient of worship. His disciples in the boat worshiped him. Uh, even at the end of his ministry, they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him, which is astonishing when you think about the fact that his first disciples were Jews, which means they had the Ten Commandments. They were raised to, to know that you, you shall not worship any other God, and yet they routinely worship Jesus, and he never once corrects them. He never once rebukes them. He simply accepts it with approval because he knew he was God in the flesh. And lastly, we see that he was the forgiver of sins. And they came bringing to him a paralytic. We referenced this earlier. Bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, that's important, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes are sitting there questioning their hearts. Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And you know, they actually had a really good point there. If you sinned against someone else, it would be terribly presumptuous for me to come to you and say, yeah, you're forgiven of that. Like only the offended party can forgive sins, which means only God really has the prerogative to forgive the sins against him. And they even had an Old Testament background for this. In Daniel, we read, To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness. I, I just can't improve upon the words of C.S. Lewis. He said, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would be either a lunatic on the level of a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He's not left that open to us. He did not intend to. As we've kind of referenced earlier, some people didn't didn't really like Jesus. In fact, the, um, the Jewish leaders conspired with Rome to have Jesus executed by crucifixion. They set this up in part with the help of one of Jesus' disciples, someone named Judas Iscariot. Now, this wasn't a surprise to God. In fact, we read that this was, uh, this was part of the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. In fact, in Revelation, we find out that this plan was developed even before the foundation of the world. This has always been God's plan of redemption from the get-go. What exactly did this plan entail? What exactly is involved with a Roman crucifixion? Well, for starters, there was the flogging. Now, this was not a quick beating, but a violent scourge. The Romans would take weapons like the ones you see over there and would just eviscerate your back, your stomach, all around. In fact, it was so violent that a lot of people died during this process. They never even made it to the cross. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand, and kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they spit on him. And they took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. So what exactly was involved with a Roman crucifixion? Because not everybody knows. Well, first of all, nails would be hammered in between the radius and the ulna to support the weight. So basically, if, if you don't know, um, in your forearm, you have these two bones. The one closest to your thumb is the radius and the one on the outside is the ulna. The nails would go right in between those to support the weight when you're hanging from the cross. One nail would be hammered into the victim's overlapping ankles. 
So the way this would work is when you're hanging from your arms, your chest cavity is expanded, which means you can't exhale, you can't breathe out, unless you push up on your feet, scraping your eviscerated back against the rugged wood of this cross, and then you could breathe out, and then you'd breathe back in and sink back down until you had to do it all over again. Basically, this process would just continue hour after hour until eventually you were just so exhausted that you could not push yourself up anymore, and you would just, you would just stop breathing. And so crucifixion was essentially a slow painful, and not to mention humiliating death by asphyxiation. This was one of the most excruciating ways to go. In fact, the word excruciating, it comes from the Latin ex cruce, which means from the cross. It was very easy to tell when someone had died, if they'd stopped moving, that meant they'd stop breathing, but usually it would end with a death blow. So um, one of those might be uh, breaking the victim's legs, which you might say, well, how's that a fatal death blow? Well, it's because if your legs are broken, you can't push up. It means you can't breathe anymore. It hastens the death. So they would break the legs, or sometimes they would just stab the victim in the heart with a spear, which that's actually what they did with Jesus. And that was how he took his final breaths. So I hope at this point you're asking the question, why? Like, if Jesus lived such a wonderful, sinless life, why did God allow all this to happen to him? And the answer is because Jesus died for us. Romans 5 says God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So this is where we get into a concept called substitutionary atonement. So let's just take that in reverse order here. What's an atonement? Well, it's a payment that brings about reconciliation for a wrong committed. So for instance, if I were to back into your mailbox, I could make atonement for that by either paying for a new one or sacrificing my time and resources to build you a new one. That's how you make atonement. Now, God's justice demands that every sin be atoned for. If God were to just take sin and sweep it under the rug without it being accounted for, that would be a radical infringement upon his own justice. It would just be a violation of his own character. Every sin has to be atoned for. In fact, Hebrew says, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. But then substitute, you already know what that is. That's someone who stands in the place of another. And so you put all this together and you see that God's mercy prompted him to send Jesus to make that atonement in our place so that we wouldn't have to. Peter says that Jesus committed no sin, but he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Tree there is a reference to the cross. And Paul writes, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of trespasses according to the riches of his grace. So put it together, on the cross, Jesus suffered the punishment that we deserve for our sins. He bore the wrath of God. You may remember the prayer he prayed, which we looked at early on. He said, Father, if it be possible, remove this cup from me. He was referring to this. The cup has a rich Old Testament background, especially in the prophets, where it refers to the wrath of God. In Isaiah, it says the cup of God's wrath, the cup of staggering, and the cup of horror and desolation in Ezekiel. At the time of the crucifixion, there was darkness over all the land while God made him to be sin. And while the guilt of our sin was being placed atop Christ, wave after wave of God's white hot wrath came crashing down upon him. Then we see separation. But he cried out on the cross that he'd been forsaken by God. This perfect relationship that the father and son had experienced from all eternity was broken in some mysterious way in that moment because our sin warrants separation from God. He took our curse upon himself. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. During the fall, when God said, cursed is the ground because of you, thorns and thistles that shall bring forth for you, well, if you remember what Christ had on his head when he was crucified, it was a crown of thorns. I don't think that's a coincidence. He took our curse upon himself. And finally, death. The Son of Man came to give his life as a ransom for many. What's a ransom? Well, it's a payment made for someone else's release so that someone else can go free. The wages of sin is death. Jesus died that death in our place so that we could go free. And really, when you combine all of this together, I actually think what you see on this slide was far worse than the physical pain itself. Bearing the wrath of God, even for an instant, would be worse than 
all of the physical pain of crucifixion combined, and that's what Jesus endured for us. But then, don't stop at his death. See his resurrection. So three days after his death, Jesus was raised from the dead in glorious immortality, never to die again, triumphing over death and Satan. Hebrews says that Jesus came so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and proving that his sacrifice had been accepted and that God's wrath had been decisively satisfied and had been turned into favor. He was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Now that word justification is very important. It's a forensic term. It means to be declared righteous in a court of law, legally. You might think of the term acquittal. That's basically what justification is. It's a declaration of righteousness. And the resurrection guarantees that the verdict of justification has been fully purchased for all who accept it. More on that in a second. And then he ascended into heaven and he sits at the right hand of the Father, which is where he is to this day. And that brings us to the glorious trade. Jesus takes away our sins. And there's a fancy name for this. It's called propitiation. It refers to a blood sacrifice that satisfies divine wrath. In 1 John 4, we read, In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And that's glorious news in and of itself, but there's more to it because we're not just in a state of moral neutrality. There's a second half to this, and that's Jesus gives us his righteousness. So the word for this is imputation. That is that God attributes or credits Christ's perfect record of righteousness to our account. That means when God looks at us from a legal standpoint, he no longer sees our sin and our wickedness. He sees the perfect righteousness of Christ just enveloping us. For our sake, he made Jesus to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's the glorious trade. He takes our sin. He gives us his righteousness. So I hope the question that you're asking now is, well, how do we get in on this? (laughs) Well, it's nothing complicated. It's just repent and believe. If you open up Mark's gospel, look down the first red letters you come to. Jesus says, the time is fulfilled. Repent and believe in the gospel. The gospel is good news. It refers to everything we've been talking about. So what is repentance? Well, repent basically means to turn away from from sin. Peter said, repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. We're to look at our sin and we say, I'm done with that. I don't want to live for that anymore. I'm decisively breaking allegiance with my former ways. I'm no longer calling the shots. Jesus is Lord of my life and I submit to him. That's repentance. Jesus even said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Second, believe which means to trust in Christ. There's a story in Acts where this uh, Philippian jailer brings out the apostles and he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You know, not just believe the Lord Jesus, believe in the Lord Jesus. Put your faith in him. So basically we come to a point where we say, I am no longer trusting in my own goodness and in my own righteousness to earn eternal life. I am trusting only in the goodness and righteousness of Jesus Christ for my eternal life. That's the sense that's used in John 3, 16, the most famous verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so seen in this way, repentance and belief are really two sides of the same coin. We turn to Christ in faith, and at the same time, we're turning away from our sins and vice versa. When we turn away from our sins, we're turning to Christ in faith. That's why sometimes in the Bible you see verses that mention one or the other or both. They're inseparable. You might could summarize this by saying repentant faith. What must I do to be saved? Repentant faith. Now some people when they hear this they're a little bit skeptical. They think to themselves, is it really that simple? Don't we have to like work for this and and contribute something on our, our part? Don't we have to earn our eternal life in some way? The answer from the Bible is absolutely not, because justification is by grace alone. Okay, grace means unmerited favor or undeserved kindness. 
In other words, it's something that you don't deserve. It's something that you haven't worked for. Romans says, now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. We don't work for grace. In fact, Romans says, if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. The very idea of earned grace is an oxymoron. It is unearned, undeserved, and unmerited. By grace alone. Second, it's through faith alone. And by that we mean apart from works. So we see that in Romans 3.28. We hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Ephesians 2.8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So you might ask at this point, why faith alone? Why not faith and works? Well, I think the answer is because there's no work we can do. <laughs> and the way I think to explain this is, have you ever seen one of these trust falls, or have you ever done one of those where like, you're at summer camp and you, you stand on an elevated platform and there's people beneath you, and basically you, you just fall? When you start to fall, is there anything you can do to catch yourself? And the answer, of course, is no. All you can do, so to speak, is put your faith in the other people to catch you. Well, in a similar way, we are standing with our backs against the precipice of hell, and we're falling. There's absolutely nothing we can do to save ourselves. Therefore, we have to put our faith in someone else to save us, in Christ to save us. And so that's one answer. The second reason is because Jesus did all the work for us. Think about it. He lived the perfect life that we could not live. He died the death that we deserve to die, and he conquered the enemy we could not conquer. To look at all that and say, that's a good start, but now I've got to add my own stuff to that, that completely misses the point. Christ said from the cross, it is finished. There's nothing else we can possibly add to the finished work of Christ. So why faith alone? Basically, it all boils down to this. Christ is sufficient. That's why it's faith alone. So grace alone, faith alone, in Christ alone. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And I think a story that really emphasizes this is the thief on the cross. So if you know the story, Jesus wasn't crucified alone. There were two robbers, on one on either side. And when they got to the cross, they were actually kind of mocking Christ. They were reviling him, just like the crowd was. But at some point, something changed in one of them. He looked to Jesus and somehow saw him for who he was, and his heart softened, and he came to repentance and faith, and he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now think about it. This thief didn't have any good works. In fact, by his own admission, he was basically a career criminal. He was never baptized, never went on mission, never took communion. And yet, what does Jesus say to him? He says, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It's another word for heaven. All of this only makes sense if justification in the eyes of God comes to us by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and that is a bedrock truth of biblical Christianity. So I, I wanted to read 1 John 5, 13 here. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. In fact, could I just ask you, do you know that you have eternal life right now? If you were to meet God today, do you know for sure what the outcome of that meeting would be? As a Christian, we can know. The reason we can know is because our eternal life is not based on our performance for God. Our eternal life is based on the perfect performance of Christ on our behalf, and his work was sufficient. So now let's put it all together in this one paragraph in Romans Paul says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. So, with all that said, you might wonder, well, do our good works not matter at all? Like, how do those even factor into this? Well, they, they matter quite a bit, because even though we're saved by faith apart from works, true faith leads to works, naturally. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, 
He it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Galatians says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I think fruit is a, a very apt metaphor here because if you look at this image over here, the oranges on the tree don't make the tree alive. Rather, they show that the tree is alive. And in a similar kind of way, our works don't make us saved. Rather, they show that we are saved. Again, for visual learners, maybe those who are mathematically inclined, most religions teach this. Faith plus works yields salvation. But that's incorrect. That's a bad chemical equation. It will blow up in your face every time. Biblically, faith yields salvation plus works. And that's the correct answer to this. So we're almost finished. New beginnings. As we come to faith in Christ, we find that God has given us new life. John says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. God promises, I will give you a new heart and I will put my spirit within you. God transforms us from the inside out. He gives us new dreams, new passions, new desires, not to live for ourselves, but to live for God and to bring glory to him. In fact, this is such a radical transformation that the Bible likens it to being born a second time. Jesus actually says, this is what marks a true conversion. And without it, you're not a Christian. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In fact, one theologian said that Christianity is not about a bad person becoming a good person. It's about a dead person becoming a living person. And that makes all the difference. So he gives us new life. Second, as we come to faith in Christ, we find that God has given us new family. So John says, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You know, there's a lot of people today who think that everyone on the planet is a child of God. That's actually not correct. We have to become children of God by receiving Christ and believing in him, and then by adoption. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And J.I. Packer said, adoption is the highest privilege of the gospel. The traitor is forgiven, brought in for supper, and given the family name. So finally, a brief word about the future. We know that Jesus will return. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now we don't know when this will happen, but we know it will happen. And that brings us to the, the resurrection. Jesus will raise the dead. There will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. Jesus will then judge the world. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. Now, as Christians, we already know what the verdict of this judgment will be because we've already been justified. For us, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we don't have to worry or stress about this. We can look forward to this. We can lift up our heads knowing that our redemption is drawing near. But for those that are not in Christ on that day, their story is very different. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And there's no getting out of that. That's really the end of the story for, for those people. But for those of us who are in Christ, Jesus will renew creation and we will live with him. John says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. This is the climax of all history. Not that we will be in perfect bodies with no more diseases. We will be reunited with loved ones, but that we will be with God. This is what all of history is headed towards, and it will be glorious. So that's basically the end of the presentation, but there was just a few things I wanted to say. If you're watching this and you're maybe not a Christian, I want you to know I'm glad that you're here. And I also wanted to just invite you to do what we've been talking about, to turn away from your sins and trust in Christ for your salvation. You might say, well, I, I need to really think about this. I need to study, study it more. And I get that. Some of that's legitimate, but don't put it off for too long. The reality is we don't know for sure when we are going to have to stand before this God. It could be 60 years from now. It could also be tomorrow. You don't want to put this on the back burner for too long. You really don't want to delay at all, actually. 
turn from your sins and trust in Christ, and then go join a Bible-believing church and just watch how God transforms your life from the inside out. He will do glorious things within you. I know that with firsthand testimony. And so, my friend, repent and believe. So anyway, thank you so much for watching. This has been a presentation by Theology with Seth. And if you've been blessed by this or have enjoyed it, please uh, subscribe. Bye.